Let's look at one more. So our goal here is we're going to show that this no even language is undecidable, where no even was all descriptions of Turing machines that only accept odd numbers. That is, they don't accept any even numbers. This one's going to look slightly different, but only slightly to the two we've seen so far. We want to build this new machine M prime such that if that machine M prime were to hypothetically receive some input X, then whenever that X was even, that implies that X was not in the language of that machine M prime. And we only want that to be the case if M halted on W. So whenever M halted on W, X does not belong to the language, otherwise it does. Something to keep in mind is that for our other two examples, so for the universal example and for the A10 example, if M ran forever on W, we accepted nothing. We could never accept, we could never hit our return statement if M ran forever on W. So in this case, what happened was any machine, any Turing machine that accepted the empty language, that accepted no inputs, did not have the property of either of these original two examples. So in this example, we're asking, does our machine have the property, does the machine's language have the property of accepting A10? This one said, does the language of this machine have the property that it does the universal thing? The empty language does not have the property of accepting A10, or of including A10. The empty language does not have the property of being the universal thing. The empty language does have the property of not having even numbers in it. But we're still going to be able to use very much the same idea here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to consider this M true that we had before to be a Turing machine that does accept some even input. So that is M true in this case does not belong to no even. But I'm still going to set things up in such a way that M prime matches M true exactly when M halts on W. But at the end, I'm going to return the opposite of what I had before. So we're going to say M true is a Turing machine that does not belong to no even. And what we're going to do is with M prime, when we receive our input X, the first thing we're going to do is run M on W. If M on W halts, then we can do M true and then return the opposite of that. So the reason I'm doing this is here, the only difference is which machine we picked for M true. So in this case, what I'm actually doing is showing not no even. So in order to show that no even is not decidable, I'm going to first show that not no even is undecidable, which should tell me that no even was undecidable as well. Because if not no even was decidable, then I could just invoke not no even and then return the opposite in order to decide no even. If one language is decidable, its opposite language is decidable as well. Basically, what we're doing is I'm giving you a template. So my goal is to give you a template for how you can prove large categories of problems. So this structure that I gave you was exactly the same structure for all three of those situations. The only thing that changed was which M true we chose. So this structure is going to work as long as we can find an M true that will allow us to fill in the definition of M prime. All of these things that we just asked about, we're asking this type of question where we said, does the machine compute a language with a certain property? For instance, did that machine only have finitely many inputs like we talked about last time? Did this machine accept a one zero and so forth? So each of these are questions about some property of the language of that machine. On the other hand, we could also ask questions like, does the program print three? Or does it run for 15 steps? Or does it accept within 15 steps? Something like that. So these are questions that are more of like questions about the implementation of the machine than what function it computes. So these types of questions that we see here, where I'm asking you a question about the function of the machine or the language of that machine, we call these semantic properties. So semantic properties are these properties that are maintained for functionally equivalent Turing machines. 
So we say two machines, two Turing machines, M and M prime, are functionally equivalent if they always give the same answer for the same input. They compute the same function, they're functionally equivalent. Regardless of how they're implemented, one could be slower, one could print things along the way, but as long as they accept and reject the same things, they're functionally equivalent. We say a function is a semantic function if it does the same thing for two inputs that are functionally equivalent. So that is, we're only asking about what the input-output behavior is for those functions, not what they did along the way. So in this case, these examples are not semantic because two programs that compute the same function may or may not print three. We could have one that prints three and the other one that doesn't. For two Turing machines that compute the same function, some of them might run for 15 steps on input X. Some of them might not. That does not change whether or not they're going to be the same function. But for these, if I have two machines that computed the same function then I knew that they were going to have the same answer when I asked these semantic properties of them. So if two, functions, if, if two machines compute the same function, and I ask this question of, does it accept 10? Then the answer is going to be the same for both machines. So this is something we call a semantic property. Any property that is the same for functionally equivalent machines is a semantic property. Anything that could be different for two machines computing the same function is not a semantic property. The statement of Rice's theorem is to say every semantic property, literally every semantic property of Turing machines is not computable except for two. Exactly two. The way it's phrased is either that semantic property is not computable or else it's trivial. Where the two examples, the two counterexamples are the trivial ones which are the ones that apply to no Turing machines or apply to all Turing machines. What Rice's theorem says is if I ask you a question about the language of a Turing machine or about the function that a Turing machine computes, either the answer is always yes, no matter what the Turing machine was that you gave me, or it was always no, no matter what the Turing machine was that you gave me, or you couldn't tell in the general case. That was an undecidable question. Those are the only three situations. Either the answer is always yes, the answer is always no, or else you couldn't tell me the answer. What we're going to do is here I've got this general pattern for these types of semantic properties. So if P is a semantic property, then let's consider this language where I'm going to say it is the set of all Turing machine descriptions where that described a machine whose language satisfied property P, whatever that was. So PTM is all descriptions of Turing machines whose languages satisfy P. So our goal is we're going to say, if I had a decider for PTM, as long as PTM wasn't one of those two trivial counterexamples, so if we have a decider for PTM, then we can use that decider to decide halt, no matter what the property is asking. So our goal is we're going to say, given an MW, where we're asking halt about that MW, we're going to define a new machine M prime such that if M prime were to receive input X, it's going to accept or reject those X's, those inputs, such that its language would eventually have the property P if and only if M on W halted. So if I had any property that I might ask, any semantic property of my Turing machines, I can define M prime in the following way. When M prime receives input X, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say M true is some Turing machine whose language does have property P. There must exist at least one Turing machine with property P for this to work. If I can't find such a Turing machine, then this reduction just does not apply in this situation. So that's why we have this one special case of if the property holds for no Turing machines, we can decide it because this reduction won't apply because I can never find such an M true. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say M true is some arbitrary Turing machine, any Turing machine, whose language does have property P. Then what we're going to do is we're going to run M on W, set Y to be equal to the result of running M true on the input X, and then give the same result as M true. So basically what we're showing here is that if... M on W halts, the language of M prime equals the language of M true, 
And therefore, M prime has property P. Because M true had property P, this was a semantic property. The answer is the same for any two machines with the same language. However, if M on W ran forever, then that means the language of M prime is equal to the empty language. It didn't accept anything. What this whole structure shows us is if property P is not trivial and the empty language doesn't have property P, then M prime has property P if and only if M on W halted. So in this case, if M on W halts, the language of M prime equals the language of M true. Since M true had property P, M prime must also have property P, whatever it is. If M runs forever on W, that means M prime doesn't accept anything. So if we were to assume, let's just go ahead and assume that the empty language doesn't have property P, then that just means that M prime has property P if and only if M halted on W. So assume that the empty language doesn't satisfy this property. In that case, since the language of M prime matches that of M true if M halted on W, and the language of M prime was the empty language if M ran forever on W, that means M prime has property P if and only if it ran forever. However, in the case that the empty language does have property P, then we can just repeat the whole procedure, but use the opposite of property P instead. We could just do not property P instead. So when we were looking at no even, the empty language does have the property of not accepting any even numbers. So therefore, this structure doesn't just work immediately for no even. However, it would work for yes even. This structure does work for yes even because the empty language does not have any even values in it. So the opposite of no even being yes even. For yes even, the empty language does not have this property of yes even. Uh, double negatives. Because the empty set has so because the empty set has the property no even, we're instead going to do yes even and then just come up with the opposite answer. So now no matter what property P is, as long as I can find at least one Turing machine M true that's going to have that property, then this makes for a reduction to show that determining whether or not a machine's language has that property is undecidable. So what we can do then is for a lot of these things that we've seen so far, if I ask you a question about a Turing machine, what you can do in order to use Rice's theorem to simplify your life is say, if that question I asked was a semantic question, then first check if it was one of these two counterexamples where these are decidable. And if so, then it's decidable. That question's a decidable question, and the answer is either always yes or always no. So for instance, if I ask the question of, does this Turing machine accept, reject, or run forever on every input? That is a property that will be true of literally every Turing machine. So if we had one of these trivial questions that was either true for every Turing machine or false, so like if I said, does this Turing machine smell bad? No Turing machines smell bad because they don't really exist. They're just mathematical ideas. So none of them have scent, so no Turing machines smell bad. That is a trivial property about Turing machines. It doesn't apply to any of them. So basically, they either have to be dumb questions like that, where you just should have known the answer already, or else it wasn't going to be a decidable thing to answer provided that question was a semantic question. If it was not a semantic question, then we can't use Rice's theorem. So for instance, does it print three? That is not a semantic question, so Rice's theorem simply doesn't apply. Does it run for 15 steps on X? Rice's theorem simply does not apply because that's not a semantic question. So if somebody is asking a question about a Turing machine and you want to figure out whether or not that was a computable thing. So let's say I ask a question about Turing machines. I want you to answer some question about Turing machines. The first thing I'm going to ask is, is this a semantic property? Will the answer be the same for any two Turing machines with the same language? If yes, then we're going to ask, is it trivial? So that is, does it apply to some Turing machines but not others? 
If the answer is yes to that, then it is not trivial, so it's undecidable. If the answer is that it always has the same answer for every single Turing machine, then it's trivial, it is decidable. If it's not, so if the answer is no, it's not a semantic property, then you have to do a reduction. So Rice's theorem just says that we have this shortcut for semantic properties. 